Um, so, with no further ado, I would like to introduce Professor Dr. Peter Solmer from the Australian National University. Uh, Professor Solomon will talk about how the study of negotropic effectors advanced our understanding of the enigmatic P1 protein. Funny enough, since uh, Peter and I are colleagues, but the first time I actually hear Peter talk science. Thank you. In a seminar. <laughs> thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you, Benjamin. Um, and thank you very much to Open Plant Pathology for the opportunity to speak here today, uh, particularly to Benjamin, Adam, and Emerson, who have taken the time to set this up and organize speakers, etc. Um, as we said, we've got the talk's going to last this long. Okay, uh, let's share the old screen. All right, so this evening, I'm going to, this evening, this morning, today, as Adam said, I'm going to talk to you about a sort of serendipitous finding we made in our study of necrotrophic effectors which has helped us gain an understanding of what the PR1 protein may, may do, which I think would be an, an advance for the field. Uh, so kicking off, I'm just going to keep this pointer here. Uh, I am aware that there are people listening to this that aren't experts in the field. Um, so I just want to place what I'm going to talk about in a little bit of context as to why we're doing it. So why do weak diseases matter? Well, um, here we can see on the left-hand side, a global picture of the wheat growing areas of the world. And the darker the green you see, the higher the um, production of wheat in that area. So you've got China, sort of in, um, India here, you've got Northern Europe, for example, very high producing areas, that kind of thing. And you can see that wheat is grown predominantly throughout most of the temperate parts of the world. It's also predominantly uh, in the Northern Hemisphere as, as well, with exceptions uh, being Australia, uh, parts of South America, uh, Northern Argentina, Brazil around there, and also some small amounts also grown in Africa. But what's it all worth? So th these are some statistics from 2017, um, taken from the FAO webpage, Global wheat production in 2017 was 717.7 .7 million tonnes. Uh, that's a lot of wheat. So if we conservatively, and for the, those of you in the field, this is obviously what you would consider a very conservative estimate uh, of disease losses of say 5% per annum. 5% of 717 million tonnes, that's 36 million tonnes of grain are lost due to disease. And that's with a very conservative estimate of 5%. Uh, obviously, that can be much, much higher in certain places. Uh, so that's how much food we're losing. And for those that are more interested in the money, uh, we're looking at around 7 billion US dollars per annum in losses. So this is why wheat diseases matter. Uh, they're important for both also food security and also the hip pocket. The wheat disease I have focused, or the pathogen I have focused my time on for the last, dare I say now, 20 years, uh, is what is known as Parastagonos renodorum. Probably not the top selling pathogen getting around, but uh, an important one nonetheless. So like many, nearly all the most important wheat diseases, it's a fungus, excuse me. Uh, it's an ascomycete, and it's a dothidiomycete of which it's closely related to many of the very common pathogens you hear about, the pyrenophoras, the bipolaruses, etc. cetera. Uh, it's the cause of the disease Septorinodorum blotch, which in Australia, uh, depends on which study you read, costs in the region of around $100 million a year in wheat yield losses, um, if you believe that number. What is important for the sake of this talk is the fact that it is a necrotrophic pathogen, okay? So that means it feeds off dead or dying tissue. It has to kill the host or be killing the host to be able to feed and reproduce. And that's much different to how we associate the rusting mildews to complete their infection cycle. And rust is something that we see all the time on different crops, roses, everything else, mildews. They do everything in their power to keep the host alive. This is different. This thing wants to go in wham, bam, and just kill everything in front of it. 
Uh, from my point of view, I would call it a model pathogen. Now, I, I call it that because I'm a microbiologist by training with a, a hint of biochemistry thrown in there. Uh, not traditional plant pathologists uh, at all. So I need something that I can grow on a plate. I need something that I can transform, do reverse genetics. Uh, it loves CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing. Uh, the, only thing, the, about the only thing we can't do with it that we'd like would be to cross it in the lab. Other than that, uh, it's a very nice beast. And here on the right, we can see what lesions look like on an infected leaf. And this is the cause of the yield loss. Predominantly is loss of uh, photosynthetic capacity because of the uh, flag leaf infections. Infection cycles, it all, it all happens pretty quickly with this fungus. Uh, it can penetrate the leaf in a number of ways. It can go through natural openings, as we can see here on the top right, where the spores germinate and the gerb tube penetrates through an open stomate. Uh, it can also directly penetrate in two ways. It can directly penetrate down anticlinal cell walls, and it typically does this in the absence of a penetration structure. Uh, we don't really understand how it does that. And lastly, it can directly penetrate over periclinal cell walls through the use of a, where it differentiates a penetration structure called a hyphopodium. Uh, we don't believe this is particularly that important for the disease itself, and we think that uh, penetration through open stomata is the way that it gains access. Once inside the leaf, it goes very quickly. So here we're looking at a GFP transformed isolate of the fungus, uh, and we've got a cross section of the wheat leaf uh, taken through the old slice carrot sectioning method. The important thing is that we can see the fungus has penetrated through this open stomate at three days post infection. What you can see is that there's fluorescence at the underside of the leaf uh, by three days. So the fungus has traversed the section of the leaf in that period of time. And that's quite rapid. By four days, we're seeing a lot of autofluorescence, uh, indicating that the leaf is very unhappy with the situation and is putting up a defense response. It's not a systemic pathogen. It doesn't travel through the vascular bundle. Uh, it's very localized to the area that the spore uh, germinates and penetrates. But by six days, and I should confess that these are under laboratory conditions, but by six days, uh, the cellular structure of the leaf is completely collapsed. And you see these large green bodies here at six days post-infection, which are the pygnidia. And these pygnidia are uh, full of asexual pygnidia spores, which can be dispersed by rain, etc., hitting the leaf, uh, and those pygnidia spores jumping from one leaf to another on the same plant or jumping across to another plant. Uh, and it, so that's how quickly it can happen. Right, well, when we kicked off this uh, 20 years ago, and this is when I started a postdoc with Richard Oliver in Perth in Western Australia, we were basically tasked with coming up with uh, approaches to try and manage the disease through fundamental science. Um, what did we really know about P. nidorum back then? I think it's fair to say virtually nothing. What we did assume, like many other necrotrophic pathogens, or their assumption thereof, is that they secreted plant cell wall degrading enzymes that basically just obliterated everything in front of them, lysed cells, the lysed cells released the nutrients, the fungus fed off the nutrients, and it was a very simplistic pathogen, basically just secreting this battery lytic enzymes and eating everything in front of it. And there was literature to support that. Uh, not a lot, but there were papers out there. So, I mean, th this was really at the start of reverse genetics and fungal pathogens. Um, so we started doing a lot of gene knockouts and we, we uncovered a lot of pathways which were important. Uh, lipid synthesis, obviously G protein signaling. Mannitol metabolism has been a uh, pet favourite of mine and Richard Oliver's for many years. But what did we learn? Did we learn anything about how the pathogen actually did cause disease at that time? No. No, we knew that certain enzymes were important, certain pathways were important. Never really had a grasp though on how the pathogen interacted with the host. We sequenced the genome of P. nidorum stago, as I'm going to call it, 
in 2004, and it was the game changer. It opened our eyes as to what this thing really did and how it did it. Uh, so 2004, we sequenced the genome for an unbelievable amount of money compared to what it cost to sequence the genome now. It was done at the Broad Institute. Uh, I had the opportunity to visit there with Richard. We saw 196 capillary Sanger sequences going absolutely full bore, 24 hours a day for a week. Uh, it's quite something else to see at the time. And for our 40 megabase genome, we generated about eight times coverage, which I know is not quite what we aim for these days, but um, they were Sanger sequencing reads, so uh, they were nice and long at least. Anyhow, long story short, this genome sequence told us that Pinodorum harbored the Toxay gene. And I'll get a little bit about to what the Toxay gene is in a minute. Many of you I'm sure will know that it is very important for many things. And through the work with Tim Fries and Ava, Bruce McDonald and Richard, Justin, a lot of big names on this paper, we put forward a hypothesis with a fair bit of evidence behind it that the Toxay gene was horizontally transferred from Penodorum to Pyronophytritis repentis, giving rise to the pathogen, well, one of the primary pathogens of wheat around the world as we now know it, the disease known as tan spot in most parts of the world. So what is Tox A? Uh, it's a small secreted effective protein um, that had been worked on for quite a while by Linda Ciffetti at Oregon State uh, in Pyronophytritis repentis, and it's known that it is required for pathogenesis. So, you can purify the protein and you can infiltrate the protein, no pathogen, just the protein, in the susceptible wheat varieties, uh, harboring the TSM1 gene. And this results in uh, host cell death and necrosis. And we can see that here, where we take the protein, we have a one mil syringe here, we have the leaf on the top of our finger and we simply just pressure infiltrate the protein into the leaf. In the presence of TSM1, we see a strong chlorosis necrosis response. In the absence of recessive lines not harboring TSM1, there's no reaction whatsoever. And we made strong use of this at the time. There's basically been a perfect market for susceptibility to pathogens harboring Toxa, which at the time uh, we knew were Staganospora and also Pyronophora. But it also completely changed the way we now consider the disease. Um, we've gone from thinking that it was this simplistic pathogen that blasts, well, not blasts is probably the wrong word to use in this field, that lies its way into the field uh, to one which actually caused disease through a complex gene for gene interaction. So, what we now know, and this all started from that genome sequence, is that Penodorum secretes effector proteins the way biotrophs secrete avirulence proteins, for example, and that these interact with dominant susceptibility or interact in a dominant susceptibility manner with genes within the host that result in host cell death and disease. So for example, if the pathogen secretes an effector and wheat uh, carries or is dominant for the corresponding susceptibility gene, we get disease. Now in the absence of either one of these two partners, either the gene in the host is missing or the pathogen is missing the effector, there is no disease. So what this is basically telling us is that wheat is carrying genes, which from what we understand from the studies we've done, and particularly through Richard Oliver's group, uh, does nothing but render the plant susceptible to disease. And there's a topic of discussion as to why it would do that. So anyway, that opened our eyes completely to how the pathogen now causes diseases and set us on the track that we've now been on for many years since. Tim Friesen and Xiao Wu uh, Liu have done a lot of work on this since, and they've discovered more effectors. Uh, Tox3, the topic of our talk today, and also Tox1, where Tim has done a lot of work looking at chitin binding, uh, as well as it inducing necrosis. So we, we, we understand a lot, so much more about this pathogen now than what we did. But today, a little bit of rehydration needed here. Today, we're talking about TOX3. Uh, and I'm excited to say you're going to see a couple of papers come out on this very shortly. Uh, 
TOX3 synthesizes the pre-pro protein, and that's very important, as you are going to see shortly. Uh, it's an 18 kilodalton protein that has three disulfide bonds formed through these six cysteines, as you can see here. I guess you'd call that relatively typical for uh, effectors secreted into the apoplast during infection. Like pretty much every other effector we all work on, the sequence gives nothing away in terms of its functionality. But we do know that if you infiltrate the purified TOX3 protein into a wheat leaf that carries or is dominant for SNN3, you get this strong disease uh, necrosis response, cell death response. In the absence of SNN3 and recessive lines, you see nothing. And that's just with the purified protein. There's no pathogen there. That's just cell death. And I'm happy to say that Megan Ottram, uh, up here in the top right corner, who's working with Simon Williams, um, previously with Boston Kobe, have uncovered the structure, generated a structure for TOPS3. I think it's down to 1.3, might be corrected, or maybe it's a fraction better now. Uh, but this is about to be soon be published as well. So how does TOPS3 cause disease? Well, we know it's important for necrosis, but we had absolutely no idea how it worked. Uh, as I said, the in protein sequence didn't give any insight. Uh, the structure has been useful, as you will see in this talk, uh, but didn't give the sort of didn't give the story away. So the first thing we went and did was just went and had a look and saw what the protein interacted with in the host. Uh, as most of us do, we started with the yeast two hybrid approach, a positive controls where we see the p53 and the t antigen interacting, and we see these blue colonies appearing, which is a positive indicator of interaction. Through an extensive screening process undertaken by Susan Breen, uh, who's now at Warwick, uh, we identified that the TOX3 protein interacted with the PR1, with APR1 protein, I should say, uh, in wheat. Uh, we've done prey and bait swaps with this, and we've got all the negative controls and everything, and we're confident from the used to hybrid, as confident as you can be with the used to hybrid, that these two proteins interacted. Uh, we've subsequently followed that up and we've done co-IPs in planter. This has been done through transient expression in Benth and shown that the proteins interact in that uh, environment. And importantly, Simon and Megan have also shown that the two proteins interact in vitro through some SPR experiments using the biocore. So there's not much more we can do to convince ourselves nor anyone else that these two proteins do actually interact. Why? So why does TOX3 bind to PL1? Well, the one thing we knew about TOX3 at the time of this finding was that the interaction was that TOX3 caused necrosis. It was unequivocal. Uh, so the first question we were able to ask is, is this interaction required to cause necrosis? Well, to answer that, um, a lot of work done by Chen Wang and Bantes Dagvadorj, uh, we looked at generating, randomly mutagenizing the TOX3 gene to basically generate hundreds of haplotypes of the protein. And then using those haplotypes through the yeast 2 hybrid approach to screen for lack of interaction with PR1. And yeah, it, it sounded like a great approach in theory, but took a lot more work than what I was actually imagining. Um, we got there and we identified that a Proline substitu uh, substitution at proline 173 to a serine in TOX3 inhibited the interaction to PR1. Uh, now, importantly, we've shown in Western blots that the protein is expressed. I can tell you it's soluble, it's solid, uh, et cetera. There's no dramas there. So this mutation uh, resulted in a TOX3 haplotype or mutant form not being able to interact with PR1. And this made sense structurally because not only do we know the structure of TOX3, we also know the structure of uh, several PR1 proteins in wheat, again, all done by Simon, Boston, and Megan. Uh, and the P173 residue does, is surface exposed in TOX3 and fits in with some of the modeling I understand that has been done uh, where an interaction may take place. So uh, that may make it, as an amino acid involved in interaction, that may make sense. So having this protein, we can, then, uh, we can then answer the question about whether the interaction of TOX3 with PR1 
is required for necrosis. And here's our TOX3 protein, which we've made our mutation at proline 173. We can purify that protein. We've taken this from mass spec, CD spectroscopy. It's, it's a happy protein. It's not unfolded. It doesn't have any problems. It's um, disulfide bridges are all intact. And what we found is that with wild type TOX3, we see necrosis as one would expect in an SN3 wheat line. Uh, similarly, for the mutant form of the protein, we also see chlorosis and necrosis. And this result tells us directly that the interaction of TOX3 with PO1 is not required for TOX3 to cause necrosis in wheat. So what does it do then? So we know that TOX3 doesn't interact with PO1 to cause necrosis, but we had no idea why it interacted with PO1 proteins. And this brought us to a, a fundamental problem that I think the field has grappled with for probably since the early 70s or so when PO1 proteins were first described. What do PO1 proteins do? Um, I know we got excited when we saw the used to hybrid result and then we sat down around a table and all thought, well, we don't actually know what they do. So there's literature out there that says a lot of things. Some PR1 proteins are apparently able to inhibit the growth of zoospores of Phytophthora, um, also potentially fungi, uh, uh, revealing a antimicrobial activity maybe. Um, there's been indications in the, not, in the recent past that PR1 has sterile binding activity and that sterile bonding activity is involved in sequestering sterols in the membrane and microbes. Uh, there's been another paper which is suggesting that PR1 actually suppresses programmed cell death um, by interacting with proteins of the RAC1 complex involved in PCD. There's been another protein that suggests that PR1 uh, um, facilitates cell death. We do know now that PR1 is becoming a, well, identifying itself as a common type of target of pathogen effectors. So not only does TOX3 from Stego interact with uh, PR1, but so does TOX8. Uh, a very nice paper come out showing that um, a ceratoplatinin from sclerotinia also interacts with PR1. And there's also a study in powdery mildew from uh, a few years ago from Hans Todell Christensen's group showing that an effective from uh, powdery mildew interacted with PR1. Didn't answer our question though as to what PR1 does. Uh, now to do, we wanted to know a little bit of, so basically to answer the question of why TOX3 interacted with PR1, we had to have some understanding of what PR1 did. So with Simon Williams, we developed a protein mediated phenotyping assay to assess what PR1 may or may not do. You can't do use agrobacterium in wheat, it doesn't work. So through the hard work of Simon and Megan and others, uh, Yi Chung in my lab and others, uh, different forms of the protein were purified to homogeneity, uh, quality assessed, infiltrated into wheat. The wheat was subsequently infected 24 hours later with this reasonably poor plate looking of um, Saganosphenodorum, and we scored for disease seven days later. So, addressing the function of PR1. If we infiltrate wheat leaves uh, with buffer, then do the infection, we see disease. And this is what, on this particular wheat line, this is consistent disease symptoms of what we would see. If we infiltrate the same wheat line with any of the PR1 proteins that we'd isolated in this case, and they're either basic or acidic, um, judging by their PI, there's virtually no disease. So the infiltration of PR1 proteins into wheat leaves as inhibited the disease response. And this is evidence in the scoring that we have here. Why? How does PR1 repress disease? Well, it's been widely reported that, uh, well, not widely, but it's getting out there that PR1 is antimicrobial. So we tested that. We purified our uh, very high pu uh, quality and purified PR1 proteins, and we incubated those proteins in different concentrations with parastagonosphenodorum and the white blobs you see in the middle of these wells are an indication of growth. And regardless of the concentration nor the isoform of the protein, there was no effect on parastagonosphenodorum growth. Uh, in our hands, 
PL1 proteins are not antimicrobial. And I can say we've done this not only with Staganospora, we've done this with a Phytophthora, uh, with tomato PL1s as well, and we've also done it with Pseudomonas Syringi DC3000. And we see no evidence whatsoever that uh, PL1 proteins are directly antimicrobial. So if it's not antimicrobial, what's it doing? Uh, inducing a defense gene response, uh, perhaps. So we looked at the expression of the classic defense gene marker that we all look at, which is PR1. In this case, we looked at PR11 subsequent to PR1 infiltration, and we saw expression of the gene increase over time um, after infiltration of the protein. Similarly, we then looked at other markers of a defense gene response, PR5, AOS, etc., and we see the same thing. Um, I think these measurements are taken at 24 or 36 hours, I can't remember. Um, but we see increases in defense gene expression, giving us an indication that PR1 actually activates plant defense signaling. So in a very simplistic view, and we have a lot more data behind that that I'm not going into now, what the PR1 proteins do? They induce plant defense signaling, um, resulting in a host defense response, leading to a uh, limitation on infection. Why then does Toxtra interact with PR1? We can do the same assays as what I just spoke about before. We can infiltrate the leaves with buffer. We see strong disease. We see um, limited defense gene expression. We infiltrate with TOX3. And I should say that this is in a recessive SNN3 cultivar. So TOX3 is not causing necrosis in this cultivar. Okay. TOX3 really, well, we don't know what it did at this point. Uh, we see the same amount of disease as what we saw for buffer, and we see not significantly different levels of uh, PR1 and PR5 gene expression. Of course, if we infiltrate with PR1, as I showed you earlier, we see strong uh, repression of disease, and this is correlates with an increase in PR1 gene expression as well. Now, if we co-incubate PR1 and TOX3 together, oh, gee, I want to, I think for an hour, I hope I'm right on that. An hour before uh, infection, uh, infiltration, then infection, we see disease symptoms return and we see a reduction back to the buffer levels of both PR1 and PR5 gene expression, suggesting that the interaction of TOX3 with PR1 actually prevents the defense signaling function of PR1. That's all well and good, but is this interaction with PR1 required for disease? Well, we can answer this because we've made this protein. This protein, the P173S mutation, that doesn't interact with TOX3. We know that this protein still causes necrosis. However, we can now infiltrate this into recessive SNN3 lines, uh, do the inoculation in. With buffer, we see disease. With PR1 infiltrations, we see reduced disease, as I've said several times. We co-incubate TOX3 and PR1. We see those disease symptoms return because TOX3 is binding to PR1 and stopping PR1 defense signaling is what we're thinking. However, if TOX3 can't interact with PR1, as is the case with the mutant, PR1 defense signaling appears allowed to uh, go on like it was unaffected, and there is some resistance to the fungus. So why does TOX3 interact with PR1 proteins? TOX3 interacts with PR1 to repress defense signaling and facilitate disease. How? And this is where we get more into how PR1 actually functions. So there's a paper that came out, hang on a second. A paper that came out oh, six years ago now, from Mute Run Chen's laboratory in Taiwan, talking about how they identified uh, in the apoplast, I think, uh, a peptide called Kate one which is actually the last 11 amino acids in the C-terminus of the PR1 protein in tomato. And Kate one this peptide, could induce resistance to Pseudomonas syringi DC3000. Uh, what is really interesting to note, and they published this, is that this peptide is conserved in all PR1 proteins. Not only just PR1 proteins, but the larger superfamily that PR1 proteins exist in, called the CAT family or superfamily. And that includes proteins in, uh, I hate to say, but in brain tumors and things like that. 
that are highly abundant uh, in brain tumors, this uh, peptide is conserved in these proteins as well. So this gave us an indication that perhaps the C-terminus region or PR1 is required for resistance to Steganospermin odorum. And here's our, one of our PR1 proteins, PR17. We use this one because it tend to be a little bit easier to make than the others. The purple part of the C-terminus indicates the K1 region. So we can see here in the structure, um, if we infiltrate PR17, we see the same phenotype. PR1 induces a defense response and we don't see obviously very limited disease. Now, if we make that same protein, but we take the K1 peptide off and we've purified that, as you can see, it's purified to homogeneity, uh, we see disease symptoms return quite strongly, providing us with a pretty good indication that this peptide is important for disease, or at least the c terminus. We could also infiltrate the PR118 protein, which not only has K1, but has about another 14 amino acids called the C-terminal X, whoop, give the story away, C-terminal extension at the C-terminus, and we see partial disease symptoms return, which gives us further evidence that not so much as K1, but how important this C-terminal region is of the protein for its ultimate function. We can infiltrate the purified peptides. These are easy to order. Uh, in the blue, we see buffer infiltration. We're looking at PR1 gene expression here. In red, we see PR1 gene expression uh, infilt after infilt PR1 gene expression after infiltrated with PR1. And in the orange yellow line, we see the PR1 gene expression when infiltrated with K1. And we see a stronger defense, uh, stronger induction there. So further evidence that K1 is playing a role. Does the K1 peptide induce disease repression? Well, we've got our buffer, we've infiltrated, we've got our PR1 reduces disease, as I've said. 1,500 times now. Uh, this is reflected in the um, PR1 gene expression levels here. Not massive in this case, but the, it's significantly increased. Uh, if we introduce K1 into the system rather than PR1, we see strong uh, disease, uh, resistance levels. There's a lack of disease there, and we also see defense gene expression correlate with PR1 levels. We do, what we do know from the K1 peptide is that there are uh, conserved amino acids in there. And we postulated that these could be uh, important for the function of the peptide. So we replace those con highly conserved amino acids with alanines. And lo and behold, uh, the peptide no longer was able to induce a defense response, as we can see in the defense gene levels, and that there was uh, no repression of disease whatsoever providing some pretty good evidence that PR1 was able to suppress, uh, PR1 is able to suppress disease through the release of a defense signaling peptide called K1. So let's finish on a model. Uh, without dragging this on too long. So we know, and we knew at the start of this study, that TOX3 interacts with SNN3, uh, and I'm aware that I think Justin may have talked about this at PAG earlier this year, Justin Farris, uh, about what the identity of SNN3 is, but I'm not going to go into that here. Uh, and this interaction either directly or indirectly results in cell death and necrosis and disease. We also now know that P the purified PR1 proteins and PR1 proteins are responsible defense gene activation, which ultimately results in disease resistance. And we now know that this happens by the release of this peptide, which is called K1. And that this peptide is either recognized on the surface of the cell or is internalized, which results in this response. And we know that this cleavage of K1 is either happening through biotic stress, which happening through wounding, uh, a lot of evidence to suggest that dams might be involved with this. However, we've now shown, and demonstrated, I think, quite well, that TOX3 interacts with PR1. This interaction represses defense gene activation, resulting in disease. And that is the role of TOX3, particularly in the absence in an SNN3 uh, recessive weight line. 
many, many questions here that need to be answered. Uh, how does tox reinduce necrosis? How does the whole interaction with SN and through work? Uh, and I can say we are working on that quite closely with Justin and uh, particularly Justin and also Tim Friesen. Uh, peptide recognition. Is there a receptor on the surface of the cell that's recognizing K1? That wouldn't be unheard of. It's there certainly are peptide receptors on the surface of cells, membrane bound receptors. Uh, and we don't know what's happening here downstream in terms of defense gene activation and disease resistance, but it's something we're now starting to um, think about. Uh, one, one other area is what's happening here with the cleavage. And I'm not going to go into this because of the time limits for this. And I'm sure you're sick of hearing my voice at this point. Is that uh, we now have some very good evidence. Well, it's a little bit preliminary, but pretty good evidence that uh, K1 is cleaved by serine protease. And we've now demonstrated pretty unequivocally that TOX3 prevents this cleavage. So TOX3 is interacting with PR1 proteins to prevent the cleavage of K1 by this serine protease. Um, and hopefully that's a story you're gonna hear a lot more about shortly. So the take home message, I guess, is that TOX3 is a dual functional effector and it is required for disease. And it is uh, required in two ways. So in dominant, in SNN3 dominant wheat lines, it can cause necrosis. And that necrosis is really important because we're talking about a ne uh, necrotrophic pathogen. In res SNN3 recessive lines, uh, TOX3 plays more of a role in the way that it interacts with PR1, uh, resulting in a suppression of plant defense responses. And importantly, we've shown through our, uh, the protein biochemistry approach we've taken, is that these two functions are independent of each other. So I'd like to finish on this slide because I, I like to think back as to where we were and where we've gotten to now that I'm considerably greater than what, what I was when I started, is, um, is the interaction of the fungus and the host as simple as we thought? Well, in two, before 2006, we thought this was all pretty simple. And that if you could find a transcription factor that controlled all these lytic enzymes, you could probably do something about controlling a disease through one approach or another. Uh, but from that point, from the realization that Pinodorum harbored Tox A, and then subsequently Tox 1, Tox 3, and I know there's others on the way, no, it's not that simple. And um, it, it, Pinodorum does secrete effector proteins that cause cell death and necrosis, uh, and ultimately disease in a gene for gene manner. So we also now understand that the fungus has effective means of minimizing plant defenses. And we know this not only through TOX3, which binds to PR1, uh, there's a publication from North Dakota that TOX-A also binds to a PR1 protein. And Tim Friesen's also done some very nice work showing that TOX1, which induces necrosis on an SNM1 wheat line, binds to chitin and minimizes plant defense responses through that approach. So clearly this is a very complex interaction with uh, that'll probably see me out to retirement with any luck. Uh, and on that note, uh, I'm sure you're all out there and I'm not just talking to this computer screen, uh, but thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I should really thank uh, Yi Chang Sung, who's right here. He's done a lot of the bench work associated with this. Bayonto has chipped in very nicely, as has Chen, particularly with de developing the P173 mutant. Uh, this work would not have been possible without the help of an collaboration with Simon Williams and his laboratory, and in particular, Megan Ottram, who's just finished her PhD and has now started with Simon. Uh, this has all been work that we've been doing with Boston Covey and uh, Susan, who's now uh, with Murray Grant in Warwick, but spent a long time on this project with me as well. And thank you all very much for listening. And I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Peter. A very exciting talk, I find. Um, thank you for sharing this with us. So there have been a couple of questions. The first question was from John Evan. Um, what, type of, what type of wine are you drinking? Uh, you know, I'd be lying if I could actually tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, something with crimes or something. It tastes all right. All right. Uh, so, the more question coming in of people, you're more than welcome to post a question directly um, on the question forum. 
So one question from Tabioso Macises. Could you use like PA1 proteins to prime against defense in the field? Yeah, uh, you could. Um, I think the underlying prop, uh, hang on, I'm you. I am drinking 19 crimes, it's called. <laughs> I probably should remember that. Sorry, sensible question. Uh, in theory, possibly so. Uh, the protein is not particularly simple to make and getting it into the plant would be problematic. Uh, I think there is a lot more promise in understanding how PR1 proteins actually work and potentially manipulating host defense through that approach, uh, particularly the K1 peptide. It's 11 amino acids versus 100 and something amino acids of the protein. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, everyone's thinking a lot. It, it, people have thought about these things with PR1 proteins for many years, uh, since the first transgenics were made in the early 90s. All right, cool, thank you. So another one um, from Jan van Kan. How does this relate to vacuole isoforms of PR1? Uh, which the tox one proteins cannot physically inter physically reach? Good question. Don't know, yeah. Um, oh, I, we honestly don't know the answer to that question. Um, we thought about it. There are multiple forms. In, so in wheat, there's 23 PR1 proteins, uh, which has significantly hampered our studies with this. We've now just moved to a rabbitopsis. We've looked at basic proteins, we've looked at acidic proteins. Uh, basic proteins um, are far more effective in terms of plant defense from what I recall than acidic. Uh, basic proteins with C-terminal extensions do very little. So we, we're at a point where we can, under, we can differentiate between the different PR1 proteins. We don't actually know which ones are expressed during infection. Um, there's very little data out there there's lots of microarray data, et cetera, out there showing you what PR1 proteins go up and down during disease in wheat, but you, you can't resolve from those microarrays and those these very early next-gen studies which PR1 protein we're actually talking about. So we don't actually know which PR1 proteins are playing a significant role in disease. So, yes, there are vacuola PR1 proteins, and we don't know. We suspect that it is not... They are not the target of TOX3, um, but I don't want to rule anything out until we've addressed that better. All right, thank you. So there was another question along this line because you just mentioned. Uh, so what do you think was first, TOX3, PA1, or TOX3, SN3 interactions? Uh, that's a good question. Um, oh. I'm sure a lot of people would jump up and down and scream if I said this, but I, I mean, I, I can't help but think in days gone by, and obviously I'm talking many, many, many years ago, thousands of years ago, Nadorum was an endophyte. And as part of it being an endophyte, it harbored proteins which uh, enabled it to undergo that endophytic lifestyle, uh, suppressing PR1 mediated defense would be one of those. I, I want to say, and pure speculation, I want to say that over time, uh, since domestication of wheat, etc., that the fungus has evolved or acquired the ability to be able to cause necrosis. Perhaps in Tox3's case, it has evolved that ability. Um, so, you know, after a couple of wines and me talking to myself on this computer, I, I would... I could potentially throw my arms in the air and say, why don't we say uh, it interacted with PR1 first and evolved the ability to interact with SN3 after and have a discussion based on that. Cool, thank you. So many more questions. I hope you have your uh, wine class filled. Um, so from Lisa Wallencourt, is there a guard protein for PA1 that recognizes TOX3 in the dominant bead protein background? Uh, good question. No, I don't think so. Um, we, uh, we, we certainly don't have any evidence for that. Um, we didn't pick anything else up 
that would give us an indication of that in protein binding studies that we did, protein interaction studies. Um, so nothing that we have at this stage, Lisa, no. Thank you. All right, so there are two questions uh, from two people around Cape 1 and other stresses. So Cape 1 was shown to be involved as in saline susceptibility um, and also maybe other type, uh, types of stresses. Um, do you think there's any relation, like interaction between these different stresses Cape 1 is involved in? and your disease uh, immune phenotype? Uh, in that case, no. I, I, I'm not so sure about that. I, and I think this comes back to an earlier question about where Jan van Kahn mentioned something about uh, vacuola PR1s and you, you potentially take that out a little bit further to what PR1 proteins actually do. And I think you can extend that out to PR1 proteins and also the CAP superfamily. And there's, there's other proteins in plants that harbor this Cape 1 peptide that aren't PR1 proteins. Um, I don't think what was found, for example, with the saline response from the same group in Taiwan has probably much to do with disease resistance. I think what they're trying to look for is a, a magic uh, peptide signaling molecule, which K1 certainly seems to be of interest, um, that could have a role across the different phenotypes. I'm not sure there's any relation between what they found with that saline response and what they and also us have demonstrated with the pathogenicity, the biotic stress. Cool, thank you. Um, I'm gonna take like two or three more questions because I'm having too much wine and it's challenging to focus on too many questions. <laughs> It is a little taxing. Uh, all right, so we're going to take three more. One is from Mr. Um, Elisha Sain. Um, you may know him. Uh, so, have you screened the culture filtrate of other pathogens, for example, Pibularis, Alzheimer's, and Pomeritritis, a first impression of PA1, Cape 1 cleavage? Also, is Cape 1 induced response back one dependent? Um, we don't know about back one because we um, Tox3 doesn't cause necrosis in anything simple that we can actually test that. So what we'd like to be able to do is express Tox3 uh, in, say, Banth and be able to knock down back one and all those kinds of things and look at that response. And we haven't been able to do that. Um, Tox3 doesn't have a phenotype. If you infiltrate it or express it in Banth, um, it doesn't have a phenotype. I think we've done it with SNN3 as well. I can say the same for Toxa and TSM1 doesn't do anything. So it's very hard to answer those questions, um, which if, if it doesn't have a phenotype in Benth means we have to do it in wheat and uh, yeah, that's not happening. Um, what was the first one? Oh yeah, about the culture filtrates. No, we, we haven't done the culture filtrates and that's a typical Eli question. Um, what we have done, though, is we've looked at one or two pathogens, I think Zymoceptoria being one of them, through a yeast to hybrid approach and look for effectors that may interact with PR1, and we haven't found anything so far. But the, the, the idea of using culture filtrates is, yeah, not a bad one. Oh, thank you. Two more. Um... So, and the remaining one I will post on Slack and you might get to this later. Um, so, another question was around, uh, I think you answered this before, but I think there was a confirmation. Do you mean that Cape 1 Tox 3 cleavage prevents the cleavage of PA1 from the same protease? So, I guess the question was, does the interaction between Tox3 and PA1 uh, shield the protease cleavage side, which would really lead to the release of Cape one That was your hypothesis? Yeah, but potentially, yeah. And I, I, I'm gonna, I would leave that to uh, Simon and Megan to actually say more about the structural interaction of the two and what the modeling has shown. But the data we have very strongly suggests that um, you, into, you put um, apoplastic wash fluid or you get to a very close stage of purifying this particular serum protease with PR1 and you see the Cape1 less 
PR1 form on a gel. Now, if you include TOX3 in that reaction, there is no cleavage whatsoever of PR1. So there is a, we, we assume it's a structural inhibition of, given that we've shown that PR1 interacts with TOX3, we assume it's a structural inhibition, basically, of, um, or a physical inhib inhibition of the cleavage of the K1 peptide from PR1 by TOX3. Cool. The last one and the remaining question, we will uh, move to Slack. Thank you. Um, so the last one, do you have, it's kind of half related for Carchin 10. Have you found TOX3 mutant haplotypes that lost or have a reduced SN3 dependent necrosis? Um, have we found them? No, I mean, those guys have done They've looked more at the sort of haplotypes of TOX3. We've made, we've made uh, lots of haplotypes or mutants, whatever you want to call them, of TOX3. Um, we'd love to do those experiments, but expressing these proteins is really, really challenging. Uh, TOX3 is disulfide bonded. Um, Simon and Megan worked very hard to get enough protein through I couldn't tell you how many hundreds of liters of E. coli uh, to get enough protein for crystallization. So to actually work work backwards and do that with different haplotypes of the protein would be challenging. Be good fun, but I'm not sure I'd have a student that'd be keen. Right. Let's take the last one, um, just because we while while we ended. Uh, that was from Jan van Kahn again. Uh, how can you reconcile your data with observations of the Gilchrist lab, which suggests that PA1 suppresses a cell death. Yeah, um, that's a good question, yeah. Uh, and I think we've spoken about this before and I'm not sure I made much sense then. I'll, I'll try to do a little bit better now. Uh, yeah, so the Gilchrist lab showed, I think quite nicely, uh, that PR1 acted as an inhibitor of cell death around, basically a, as a mechanism for preventing the spread of a hypersensitive response, if I remember correctly. Um, we, we do not see that. We, we've done co-infiltrations of TOX3 and PR1 in SNN3 dominant wheat lines. And if anything, we might see a fractional increase in the crisis, not the other way. How do we reconcile that? Well, we, I think the easiest answer to that is possibly that, um, the, the cell death mechanism induced by TOX3 is not RAC1 dependent as I think, and I'm, I'm a couple of lines into this talk here, uh, as I think the Gilcrest lab showed. Um, so I guess basically in its simple form is that TOX3 potentially would induce a cell death through a mechanism different to what was uh, shown by David's lab. That, that's our explanation at this point. Um, we just haven't seen that inhibition yet. And that it was good work. I'm, I'm sure that is definitely the case. But I think we may be working on a different uh, mechanism of cell death. Cool, thank you. Uh, some good tough questions at the end. Uh, thank you again, um, Peter, for a very exciting talk. <laughs>